<laughs> All right, let me introduce your speaker tonight. So, we have a panel of international guests. We have a panel of amazing people to talk about Bitcoin. So, let's introduce them. Firstly, she's not just Canadian. She's also done... <laughs> Don't give me that look. <laughs> She's also done neuroscience research for really competitive Scrabble pairs. So please help and join me in welcoming Kaya Maya Smith. Oh. Sorry? Take a seat. This is one of those networking things, so. No, I'm not. All right, next up we have. Hmm, who should I introduce next? Somebody who owns a pet Darwin carpet python. He's not just the man from Monero with a blockchain center. He also owns a very big snake. So let's welcome Key Jeffries. No. <laughs> Next up, we have... Uh, he's not just an international guest wanting a taste of that sweet Melbourne pie. He also was a judge to three preliminary competitions of Miss Universe. So, Enchain CEO, Jimmy Nguyen. Um, our final speaker before we introduce the moderator is Somebody, I'm just trying to remember what her correct fact. She had a startup who had patented a technology to make things smell. So whether it's opening up a newspaper and making it smell like lemon myrtle or turning cinnamon to smell like coffee, she's also the founder of a company that will help maybe quite a few of you for Valentine's Day. So um, she can talk more about that, but founder of Intimate.io, let's welcome Leah. She also has a bag of goodies with her and that's not figurative. And finally, we have our moderator, the person who's organized this tonight. He's not just co-working Taylor, he's also a martial arts teacher. So be careful, everybody. I'm going to say goodbye now. John from the Blockchain Centre. Welcome, Taylor Tran. Uh, thank you, John. And thank you to Pause Fest for making tonight uh, possible. Um, so Pause Fest is happening right now. It was uh, yesterday, today, and t tomorrow is the, next, uh, the last day, although there are a range of other events as well. Um, what we've done is we've taken the opportunity of um, you know, Pause Fest bringing international speakers uh, to our shores. And it's an opportunity to, I guess, drag a couple of the uh, Bitcoin blockchain people out to talk to this community. So um, you know, this is why we're here. Uh, and we've got uh, mainly Jim Nguyen, Jimmy Nguyen, um, who's going to talk a lot about Bitcoin. Um, and we've got Aaliyah. Uh, as well, who is uh, Aussie but uh, currently living in the Philippines, uh, you know, running a very exciting blockchain-related e-commerce business, which I'm sure Leah will, uh, will get into. So um, without too much further ado, what I want to do is fa ask fairly open-ended questions to the panelists so that you can get to know the panelists a little bit more. Uh, the main purpose of today is really to help this community to, you know, get a big picture of it's, it is actually the 10th year of Bitcoin and hence blockchain. So it's a 10th year anniversary, literally this month, um, this month, last month. And you know, we've come a long way. So let's reflect on where we came from, where we are now, and you know, where it's going to be in the next 10, year, 10 years. So um, you know, what we want to do is just get a big picture, but quality um, appreciation of you, you know, the journey of, of collaboration and creating a peer-to-peer -peer cash system to enable our life and our work. So, you know, that's kind of the objective today, to have uh, a synthesized understanding, big picture, but quality understanding from our international experience speakers on this topic of Bitcoin and blockchain. So, without further ado, I'm going to ask um, 
I think we might, we'll go, we'll go straight to Jimmy. Uh, we'll ask the question to tell us, you know, what got you into this whole thing about, about Bitcoin and blockchain? You know, tell us a little bit of a story on, on sure. how, how you came, this came about. Uh, I'm from the United States. Hello everyone, I'm from the United States. I grew up most of my life in Los Angeles after being born in Vietnam. Uh, and I was an IP and digital technology lawyer for about 21 years and a partner in major corporate law firms before I left my very nice, comfortable and stable life as a lawyer to join the Bitcoin and blockchain world about three years ago uh, with Enchain. Enchain is the leading, in our view, blockchain research and development business in the world. We're most known because of our chief scientist and Australian himself, Dr. Craig Wright, who is both provocative and one of the most well-known personalities in Bitcoin. Um, you can ask me all the questions you want about Dr. Wright, but he obviously has a true vision and passion for Bitcoin in its very core uh, original design and original vision, which I'll talk to you about tonight. So as a technology lawyer, I always had to sort of be monitoring and learning about the forefront of new things. Some of my clients were in the fintech space, some were in various other technology areas. Um, some of them explored virtual currencies. So I started learning about Bitcoin many years ago and clients of mine um, ended up forming the company that became Enchain and moving Dr. Wright from Australia. Uh, Sydney to London, where we've set up a whole professional shop around him. We have a very large research and development business. We are one of the largest filers of blockchain patent applications in the world, over 200 filed to date, uh, up there with IBM and Bank of America. We have a large Bitcoin mining group. As I'll talk to you about today, we believe only in the original Satoshi vision for Bitcoin, now in the form of Bitcoin SV, the only Bitcoin project that exists in our view that fulfills the original design protocol and principles of the Satoshi white paper and initial client software. Uh, and that emerged from the hard fork that was contentious of the Bitcoin cash network last November. Um, so I ended up in this world because clients of mine set up this business. They were looking for someone who um, could help lead the business function of what we do. Um, and so I took a leap of faith. Um, wanting to get out of the legal world after a lot of years in it and now have been on a huge roller coaster ride that of doing things I never expected to. So uh, right now I help lead the entire group of N-Chain companies, which includes the research and development arm. We have a corporate uh, private venture capital arm where we invest in Bitcoin startups. We do mining. We have allied partnerships with CoinGeek, Calvin Air's big media and mining site. He's well known from the online gaming world. I'm also an advisor to a public company in Canada called Squire Mining, which is working on a next generation um, mining rig uh, to improve mining efficiency and enter the competitive mining hardware market. So I have my uh, fingers in a lot of things in the Bitcoin world, and I'm also one of the key voices behind the emergence of Bitcoin SV as its own chain and token to fulfill the Satoshi vision. So I got here, kind of, I say that I didn't find Bitcoin, it kind of found me. Um, but it's been the most exciting thing I've done in my life. Thanks, Jimmy. I'm about to just go that way. Leah, tell us how you got into all this. Hi, everybody. I'm Leah. I'm a co-founder of Intimate.io. Um, just quickly before I tell you about me, I have to tell you a funny story. Um, my team members and I, we actually spent a little bit of time living in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, there's a big Bitcoin maximalist community there. We were working out of a blockchain cafe called The Block Cafe. And uh, they had a barista there and they had this coffee menu and they had all these really clever names for all the coffees. Like for example, the Americano was called the regulator. And they used to get really shitty with us because all the Australians kept asking for flat whites. And I was like, come on, you've got to make it a normal thing on the menu and you've got to call it the Craig Wright. Ah. <laughs> and they did. Wow. So yeah, there's it's actually good. a cafe go in Lisbon. I, you know what? I'm going to get Craig and we're going to fly down to Lisbon next yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> Do they call it the Craig Wright? Yeah. Oh, God. It's on there, on the menu. So if you're an Aussie and you go in, you're like, I'll have a Craig Wright, thanks. Uh, we're going to have to tweet him later. Yeah. You know, you know how he loves Twitter. <laughs> so. so that's a side note. Um, so I'm Leah. I'm from Intimate.io. Uh, I actually have a background working in renewable energy. And it was uh, sustainability that got me into blockchain in the first place. Um, I left the industry years ago kind of in a huff because I was really annoyed with the centralized nature of that industry and how I really thought that the little guy was never empowered, pun fully intended, to uh, contribute to the shortfalls of that market. And it was years later, I was sitting with a mentor and bitching and moaning about it. 
and they introduced me to this incredible case study, the Brooklyn Microgrid by Consensus, LO3 Energy and Transgrid. And I just, I had, it was my mind blown moment. Everyone has their down the rabbit hole moment. I just couldn't believe what this technology was and it took me so long to understand how this could even exist. And uh, the concept of decentralization really fascinated me. And then I was interested, well, where else can this be applied? But it was such an early stage technology and I saw so many people applying it to industries where it really wasn't needed. And I got really obsessed with this idea. Well, where do we find the perfect industry that has the pain points right now with a short journey to actually realization of being able to prove some of these complex concepts with the ability to actually bring on real users? Um, and a few months later, I met my future co-founder, Ruben Copper. Um, he actually introduced the first Bitcoin ATMs into Australia and back in 2013-14. And uh, he'd also launched an app called Rendezvous, which was um, essentially like Uber, but for booking an escort. And it was fascinating because he actually found that uh, crypto and the adult industry had a lot in common. They both had issues with stigma. They both had issues with banking, for example, regulation. Um, it was very difficult to drive them forward, but kind of ironically, it was like they could solve each other's problems. So when I started learning about the adult industry, I actually saw a lot of parallels with some work that I'd done in my earlier career around um, gender equality, women in leadership and empowerment, but also uh, access to the jobs market. And a lot of these same kind of issues was holding people back in the adult industry. Um, so anyway, I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about what Intimate is and what sort of problems we solve, but that was how I fell in love with the adult industry and saw a real opportunity to make a big change in people's lives within a relatively short time frame, have a real impact uh, with crypto and blockchain powered technologies. Uh, yeah, so my name's Key. I'm sure I've met a lot of you here. Um, my introduction to Bitcoin was probably a lot more through a computer science background. So I had come into contact with uh, asymmetric cryptography and I thought that it was really cool. This idea that you could have public and private keys and you could send something to someone which only that they could encrypt and you didn't have to have a symmetric key that you negotiated beforehand. Uh, I thought that that was a really amazing idea. But uh, I didn't really see any practical applications beyond using it in the internet, for example, using Diffie-Harman Key Exchange in browsers. Um, Bitcoin was kind of an amazing application of asymmetric cryptography and then also put on top of that a consensus scheme called Proof of Work. And you had this idea that was like completely revolutionary. And that's when I fell into it just like more than anything that I had ever fallen into before. Just grab this one, yeah. So I fell into I fell into Bitcoin more than I had ever fell into anything before. And then I started realiz realizing some of the problems with Bitcoin, namely on the privacy side of things. Um, and that's when I got into kind of developing uh, privacy infrastructure around the Monero space. Um, so that's what I do currently. I work on a, a company called Loki, which is doing uh, privacy and onion routing layers for the internet, building privacy in the internet. So that's kind of my focus. Hi, I'm Kaya, the uh, panelist you didn't ask for because like, it was the last minute edition. Hello, I know you a weren't expecting me. A very welcome one. Ah, thank you so much. Um, I feel a little bit out of place on this panel because A, I'm really jet lagged and just got off a plane and I'm like, sure, I'll do a panel that I know nothing about. Um, and B, because uh, I very much am interested in bridging my knowledge gap um, when it comes to cryptocurrency, but specifically outside of like my um, base knowledge around the white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto's vision for Bitcoin, et cetera, I've really stayed away from a lot of the communities that um, are interested in exchange of, of value and um, been very much in the supply chain tracing space before this. So I've worked as a, a product manager um, and designer for a small startup that was trying to figure out how to trace um, diamonds more effectively um, and decrease fraud. And we thought blockchain was a great use case a couple of years ago. Um, still think it is, but didn't realize how complicated that journey was going to be. And I just don't think we were ready at that time to um, really invest in that use case. Um, we're getting there now, maybe one day. Um, but after I left that startup, I kind of wanted to keep one foot in the blockchain space um, and have been co-organizing uh, with Karen, who's sitting right there. Hello, Karen. 
um, <laughs> Women in Blockchain Melbourne and uh, Blockchain for Social Impact with a couple of you as well, which um, has really kept me current. And I recently founded a business um, with some friends called Bridget.ai, which is um, an AI innovation predictor tool, hopefully one day, again, uh, we're working on it, um, that will connect in, uh, producers across supply chains to um, opportunities for collaboration and sustainability that they could not identify previously because human brains are lazy and AI is smarter than we are once we train it properly. So that's been my number one sort of uh, point of attention for the, for the time being. But recently I started looking back into use cases for blockchain for Bridget.ai and realized that there are a couple of interesting ones. And um, I, beyond that, I recently accepted a job at Consensus, so the um, yeah, blockchain venture studio uh, founded by Joseph Lubin. Um, and I'm working with Pegasus, which is the spoke that is um, a protocol engineering team working to help um, improve, I guess, the Ethereum ecosystem, so launch Ethereum 2.0 ultimately, and work on an enterprise uh, client that will be launching soon. And I can't say much about it because I haven't started yet. Melbourne and I stumbled upon uh, the blockchain center. So that's how I came into this whole uh, Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and I remember at the time the people there gave me some uh, a very small amount of bit Bitcoin. So that was my introduction to that. And uh, a couple of years ago or last year I was um, helping when, you know, during the massive hype I was helping the center expand globally because I'm, uh, you know, a bit of a Mr. Coworking. And uh, this is a co-working space, so that's kind of been my thing. And I'm, uh, as a side hustle, a tech community builder, running events like this. So just a, a brief uh, thing on me. But moving along, so it's been 10 years. Um, I wanted to ask the panel, you know, how would you summarize where we are at the moment? You know, we've certainly gone up through a crazy hype, and now it's like the crypto winter or blockchain winter. Um, you know, how would you summarize? Where are at at the moment? I, I might uh, jump in. I think uh, we're right at the perfect time to start investing in technology. So um, some of the Bitcoin protocol layer, I think, uh, should have some improvement done to it. There's some things that have been sitting um, in the BIP proposal bin for a fucking, sorry, excuse my language, for a long time now. Um, stuff like aggregate signatures, uh, you know, it really needs to go in. Confidential transactions by Greg Maxwell, really good idea. Probably should be merged into the Bitcoin Core protocol. Um, there's a lot, a lot of research that has gone into Bitcoin and uh, improving Bitcoin. Um, but a lot of it hasn't really been adopted yet by Bitcoin Core. I think they're maybe a little bit scared of forking at this point, which I understand as well because forking has this... Uh, it has a negative, uh, it's really negative for merchants and people who are trying to use Bitcoin just day to day. They don't really understand what's happening during a fork. Um, but I think there's a lot of technology out there and I think now is the time to apply technology. We've seen a huge increase in users, uh, a little bit of a dip now. now the now's the time like we need to increase scalability, we need to increase privacy at the core level. Uh, and then the next time we have this uh, you know, increase in users, which will eventually happen, I don't know when it's going to happen, we won't have the same issues that we had uh, back in 2017, 18, right, when we had this massive increase. So now is the time to put in technology that's going to fix the problems that we faced three months ago, or longer than three months ago, nearly a year ago now. Me next? <laughs> um, yeah, I have to agree. I, I actually, um, I come from the merchant side of things because um, I head up uh, the space of merchants, part partnerships, um, and basically driving consumer adoption for our company. And... Um, there, this is still such an early stage technology, but I really think that we have to work together to make sure that whatever we introduce is smooth and it doesn't disrupt uh, that ecosystem of people who are actually trying to drive consumer payments. I'm actually really excited to be here because when Taylor first asked me to come along, he said it was going to be a very technical discussion around Bitcoin SV and I said, you know, I, I don't know that I'm really the right person to come along from that because I'm not a technical background. I'm around business development and driving adoption and growth. Um, but he wanted me to come along anyway, and I think that's really powerful because we can't live in an echo chamber of just talking about new protocols and new technologies that we can 
bring in. It has to be about, well, what does that actually mean to the existing ecosystem? How are people going to adopt it? Because when I'm out there talking to merchants every day, I usually hear one of two things. Either I installed a crypto payment gateway and no one used it, I didn't see any revenue turnover, why would I bother? Or secondly, I don't know, I'm a smart guy, but like I find this space pretty intimidating and I don't understand it. So if we're ever going to drive mass scale adoption and see any kind of change, we need to make sure that these new technologies and new protocols are introduced in a way that doesn't kind of scare people away, thinking like, oh shit, another fork, I don't even know what that means. Like, this is just too hard, chuck it in the too hard basket. Um, so the question is about how I feel about where we are in the Bitcoin and blockchain space 10 years in. So if you'll give me a moment, um, let me tell you our perspective, which is very different than I think um, most of the perspective of the rest of the blockchain world. Craig Wright, me, all of us that work at Enchain and on this particular camp believe something very simple. There should be one single global digital currency and one public blockchain. There are far too many. There is a reason why there are far too many, and it's because Bitcoin Core's development team, once they took control of the Bitcoin protocol, did not allow Bitcoin to grow into what it should have been. We are 10 years since the Genesis block that birthed the Bitcoin blockchain, which was on January 3rd, 10 years ago, last month, and a little over 10 years since the birth of an introduction of the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper. If you go back and read the white paper, which is the birthed the original blockchain, has a very simple vision, a global peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, meaning a cryptocurrency that could be used as daily cash, not as a long-term store of value. And early Satoshi writings also make clear that Satoshi believed the Bitcoin network could scale immediately back in 2009 and 2010 to surpass Visa network capacity and speed and that it was capable of doing many different types of functions beyond just being a payment network, that it could create the functions that we think of now for other blockchains, such as smart contracts and tokens and other things that we think of on Ethereum. But in the history of what happened with Bitcoin is once Satoshi sort of withdrew from public eye and eventually the keys to the kingdom got left with other people, Bitcoin Core's development team to control the Bitcoin protocol and veered away from the Satoshi vision for Bitcoin in several key ways, the most important of which was limiting the block size, which remained for many years and still does to one megabyte in size, which is very small. If you have a megabyte size block that allows you to do maybe three transactions a second on average or at peak capacity, seven transactions a second, and that is nowhere near the scale you need to rival the Visa, MasterCard, other payment systems where you need thousands and tens of thousands of transactions a second, particularly at peak periods. And instead, Bitcoin Core with other partners such as Blockstream pursued layer two solutions for payment processing such as the Lightning Network. Um, and then they wanted to introduce segregated witness which was a technical feature which in our view forever changed what Bitcoin was by segregating, separating off the witness data, the signature data from transactions as they were embedded into the blockchain, and thus forever changing what Bitcoin was because the white paper very clearly defines a coin as a chain of digital signatures. And that chain of digital signatures is key to the security model of Bitcoin as well as relying on miners proof of work. And so once in 2017, segregated witness got added to the chain, there was at that time, as you recall, a big conflict within the Bitcoin community, which had been brewing for years. People who wanted to push the blocks bigger versus the people who wanted to keep the blocks smaller and pursue layer two solutions. In our view, if you want to keep the block small and pursue layer two or off-chain scaling solutions, that is not Bitcoin anymore. That is not the path that was designed by the white paper or by early Satoshi writings. That's something else. And if you want to do that in our view, that's fine. Go do it. Just don't call it Bitcoin anymore. That led to a fork of the Bitcoin chain in August of 2017, which created Bitcoin Cash. At the time, an effort to reclaim the original Satoshi path with a path and roadmap to bigger scaling, bigger blocks, as opposed to veering by adding segregated witness and going down a different path. We and our allies supported Bitcoin Cash for a good period of time until this past year, because we believed it was going to be the closest thing to restoring that original Satoshi vision. So unlike Bitcoin Core, which remained at one megabyte in size, 
Bitcoin Cash was birthed in August 2017 with an initial default block size of 8 megabytes as opposed to 1. So a decent leap up, but still nowhere near big enough to create a global peer-to-peer -peer cash system. Then we worked with the protocol developer groups, including Bitcoin ABC, the lead one, to plan a technical roadmap that led in May of last year to another network upgrade, which raised the block size to 32 megabytes, so a nice move up towards scaling. And then later last year, it became apparent to us that the Bitcoin ABC development team had other plans to continue changing the Bitcoin protocol and veering away again from the original Satoshi design, as we call it. And so that led to a big battle at the end of last year and a November hard fork, which created the separate chain, which survives now on its own as Bitcoin SV, which we named for the Satoshi vision. And Bitcoin ABC made a number of changes, both before and during the hard fork, which again demonstrated their willingness to forever change the protocol. They changed the transaction ordering, they added a new opcode that wasn't in the Satoshi design. Um, during the hash war that happened, they implemented things such as a checkpoint and 10 block reorganization defense so that they as developer groups determine what's the blockchain as opposed to relying on miners proof of work to validate the blockchain, which was a huge um, move away from Bitcoin and cause them to lose a lot of even their own supporters at the time. And the big difference between what we are pursuing and what the other Bitcoin projects have pursued is we do not want Bitcoin and its protocol to be a constant developer experimental playground. This should not be a situation where developer groups, because they think they know better, decide every six months, I want to change this to the protocol, I want to add this to the protocol, let me try this. You cannot build a global money system as well as a blockchain that you want the biggest enterprises of the world to operate on and build their applications on unless you have a protocol that is stable, that is secure and massively scalable. So another big difference is we want to scale much faster than the ABC camp did. Um, and that caused this rift now there's a new chain and we are out um, very aggressively and proactively launching the birth of what we call the rebirth of the original Bitcoin. We're very dedicated to a very simple mission. Restore the original Satoshi protocol in the form of Satoshi client software version 0.1. Keep it stable. Don't make any other changes to it allow it to massively scale. Our team is working on scaling solutions which have been needed in Bitcoin forever. So for example, the largest blocks ever mined on a public blockchain have been mined on Bitcoin SV in the last few months. 63, 64, 65 megabytes, 103 megabyte block was mined on um, January 3rd of this year. Our team now has up and running a BSV scaling test network which demonstrated that blocks of that size could be done on a sustained, not just a one-off basis. So in the test network, they recently proved the ability to do 24 hours consecutively of sustained 64 meg and up to 100 meg blocks. They're planning another professional stress test to prove that on the live network in the next few months. And later this year, we're going to move the default block size to 512 megabytes on the road to one to two gig size blocks. And one day having no block size and making it just be minor configurable and creating a competitive fee marketplace. So our message and our path of how we got here is very simple. Bitcoin got screwed up by developer groups who thought they knew better. We're going to restore to its original path and just let it have no limits and let enterprises and the Bitcoin developer community use their creativity to build on top of the protocol, not mucking around with the protocol. That's the only reason we have all of these other cryptocurrencies and blockchains today, because the core developer group didn't allow Bitcoin to be what it was meant to be. Vitalik would have built the Ethereum network on Bitcoin had he been allowed to do so with his colleagues. It was the restrictions placed on Bitcoin and the veering away from the Satoshi protocol that created the entire universe we have today of too many coins and one day we think it will consolidate to a single digital currency and a single global public blockchain that's on Bitcoin in the form of BSV. I'll, uh... I'll ask Taya to uh, also talk about the observation for the last 10 years, and then I might uh, throw it to Key to uh, throw back and forth some technical questions. We're going to do questions at the end of the two more questions that I've got, and um, if you have a question, if I can ask you to line up either, either side uh, so that the camera can see you uh, to ask the question. 
So, uh, so yeah, your observation, 10 years. Okay. What do you think? Well, first of all, thank you so much for um, a very cohesive kind of overview that is doing exactly what I hoped would happen for me, which is kind of breaking down that barrier of comprehension and of trust um, that kind of exists within and across, unfortunately, the blockchain community at the moment. And I didn't mention before, but my background is um, I specialized in neuroscience and I got out of neuroscience research. I was um, specifically doing a bit of cognition and a bit of um, artificial neural networks back when they weren't as good as they are now and we thought that they weren't going anywhere. Um, but what I hated about, it, about the research world was the silos that were created when people just kept on keeping their heads down, wanted to be the visionary or didn't want to collaborate. And I wanted to find ways to change that. So that's what my uh, vision has always been about with my current business. Um, and that's how I've always seen AI um, as being like this incredible tool to enable. But with blockchain, I think that we were all kind of in a space where we thought that this was um, the answer to many problems and we were doing a lot really fast. And um, yeah, it's really good to hear that side of things and really realize that this is supposed to be, at, at its very core, this is a very collaborative, disruptive technology. And if it's disruptive to be collaborative, then we're not being very disruptive right now and we're not really um, able to change what's happening in the, in the larger ecosystem of the world. We're not actually um, doing anything new until we can figure this out. So I think what this time is, and I'll leave it short, because I'm not actually, I want to hear more from people that actually have a lot more um, interest in the Bitcoin in particular part. But I want to say that um, I think this is the stage where we iterate and we reinvent and we sometimes start from scratch, throw everything out. And um, I think that's how everything great works. And um, I'm really excited to see what happens and hear more. Okay, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I guess I just have a question for Jimmy. Like, you said that you like don't want, to a certain extent, you don't want developers like treating the network as it is as if it is an experimental, like experiments in the wild kind of thing. But how do you guys plan to lock down the protocol itself? Because nodes decide what they run, right? So typically, like if a miner wants to decide that they want to run a different version of your protocol, how would you stop that? Yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, this is a permissionless system. Um, that's why we're being very clear about what the ethos is of Bitcoin SV. And so that the people who come work in our ecosystem and our blockchain agree with it. That's what we saw after the hard fork. There were a lot of the projects, ventures, and developer groups that had been operating on Bitcoin Cash, and some even on Bitcoin Core, that just started moving over to Bitcoin SV saying, that's all we've ever wanted, a stable protocol. Um, it's easier to build a business on a stable protocol. So um, can I forever force people not to change the protocol? No, but we can obviously with our own mining hash power, right, sway the network to keep it with a, uh, the Satoshi protocol. And in my view, developers are free to go experiment. You want to go fork and experiment and do something else? Do it. Just don't call it Bitcoin anymore. It's not Bitcoin anymore if you're changing some of the fundamental designs. That's what happened with Litecoin, for example, right? That was a fork of Bitcoin, and it changed the block intervals to you know, try a different approach. They called it something else. Fine. Go for it, right? I think the frustration particularly Craig Wright has is people wanting to constantly change what is the underlying design of Bitcoin and still calling it Bitcoin. A perfect example is there's been chatter on Twitter apparently the last week I just saw with some Bitcoin core proponents talking about possibly lifting the 21 million <coughs> supply uh, coin number in Bitcoin Core to deal with the fact that once the next halving happens on block rewards, given you know, what's going on with that network, it may not sustain the um, you know, rewards necessary to keep mining you know, going on and profitable. To which we look at that and go, oh my God, how, that, if you do that, you forever change what Bitcoin is and what people who have invested into the system all these years relied upon, right? Both as a buyer or holder of cryptocurrency or as a miner who invested in mining equipment. So our view is developers go for it, experiment all you want. But if you want to experiment on what is the original Bitcoin protocol, then you should just call yourself something else. I feel like the problem with that philosophy is like you might start off with noble intentions and everyone might be on the same page, which probably is what happened with Bitcoin. Everyone was kind of just like developing things and then there is a contentious issue that comes up again and then the, the SV community that you thought was so together or ha actually have different points of view on things and you end up just like 
the the forks are endless, right? Like, and this, this is what kind of what happened with Cash. Like, everyone in Cash was kind of together at the start, and then people had different idea about what Cash was going to be, and now there's SB and ABC. Yeah. Well, I, I think the approach we have to take is we believe in a very clear, focused roadmap, because otherwise you get the situation we have now. Lots of different you know, permutations of Bitcoin and other coins because people just didn't trust in the original Satoshi design, right? The fact that Bitcoin Core for so many years, I mean, we're 10 years into Bitcoin now and it's nowhere near where it should be because the block cap was stuck at one megabyte in size. Who on the right earth would think that's the right thing to do, right? And I understand why there might have been some early reasons to kind of limit it, um, but the fact that you veered away what, from what was clearly a system designed to scale bigger, with bigger blocks and a bigger blockchain, is what started down this path. So um, that's why we are being very clear about it. Um, can I tell you forever what's going to happen in the future? No. But so far, everyone who has joined our ecosystem has been very happy to believe that there's just going to be a stable protocol, just the limits that were imposed and restrictions are going to be lifted, and then developers should, can experiment. Um, in script on top of the protocol, and we highly encourage and welcome that. So, uh, your scaling solutions that you were talking about before, and I'll, this will be my last question yes. so we can get more people involved. Um, like the scaling solutions you're talking about before, those won't affect the protocol at the base? Like, no. okay, no. right, so it's just stuff on top. No, for example, one of the things we know is you can't just lift the block size to, you know, 512 mm. megabytes and all of a sudden, boom, the network's faster, yeah. you know? I, I, we, we get chatter about that online. Right, because it seemed, it yeah. seemed like that to me, like that's what no. Craig was saying. Because no. well, like the original, like the original split between cash and, uh, cash and SV seemed like, uh, like they were going down the idea of like, okay, let's use like graphene and stuff like mm -hmm. to scale more on the yeah. side so we can increase the block size more. Yes. I feel like they've gone further than that path now with the checkpointing thing. Oh, that was definitely. really, yeah. that, was, that was very strange. That was, um, <laughs> strange is a good word to use for that. Yeah, but uh, um, like, so yeah, yeah. you're not going to introduce any consensus changes on the no. protocol level? No, for example, um, for example, they're about to introduce Avalanche um, into Bitcoin Cash, which is a pre-consensus um, uh, technique, if you want to call it that, which in our view moves Bitcoin Cash more towards proof of stake rather than proof of work because fundamentally a lot of their developers actually don't believe in miners' proof of work and don't believe miners should really be the ones validating or even having votes, you know, because we, when we had the whole disagreements with them at the time, our camp held 40 to 45 percent of the Bitcoin Cash network hash rate and I told them, we don't want the changes you want to add and I basically got told we don't care. I said, well, then you're going against what 40 to 45 percent of your then hash rate is saying, and they didn't care. Um, and as someone who has had our group invest so much in mining, that's frustrating. But in terms of the scaling solutions, an example is we know one of the things that has to be done is improve um, the uh, speed and ability of blocks and transactions to propagate. Um, so Steve Shatters, our lead developer at Enchain, who's also the technical director of the Bitcoin SV node team, has been working with our team on different software tools and solutions to have, uh, make it easier for nodes to propagate larger blocks faster. That does not require any change to the consensus protocol. It's, it's a software that nodes would run. <coughs> so, um, so technology is one thing. Um, I want to explore the human side of um, of everything, um, because you know, as we talk about all these protocols and so forth, um, you know, guess who's guess who's coding them, or who's managing all these things? It, it's people. Um, so I want to explore, you know, what have we learned about human nature as we have gone through this journey? And uh, you know, I, as an observer, have seen a few things that really hasn't played out. For example, you know. Uh, a common thing that people say about blockchain is going to remove the middleman. You know, no, no middleman has been removed because you know there are loads of middlemen in this whole process, um, whether that be the miners, you know, the coders, and so forth. Like, I'm not a tech uh, blockchain tech expert. I'm going to be working with a middleman who's going to code the stuff that I want me to do. Um, the other thing we've seen is uh, you know technology. Technology adoption. So I used to work in the tel telecommunication industry, uh, and saw how mobile phones were taken up. I also work in the oil industry, and, and kind of seeing how electric cars were uh, sort of being taken up. And you know, one realized I 
I, I had uh, when I was working for an oil company, um, they were talking about how um, electric cars were going to change the world uh, and so forth. I did the numbers and it, it, uh, in Australia there's about 16 or million cars and uh, every year there's a new million added to the base. Um, and so, so if every car, for example, uh, that were sold today were electric cars, it's going to take 17 years for the whole thing to turn over. So, you know, people get a little bit too excited about uh, how things are going to change. Uh, and there have been a lot of phrases around how, you know, we should replace the government and all these hype or overstatements about the industry. Uh, and then obviously, you know, with the, uh, with the hype uh, we had in 2018 or 17, um, you know, we saw a lot of excesses and, and you know, uh, crazy behaviour. So the question is, uh, you know, what do you think we've learnt uh, over the last 10 years? And feel free to touch on any aspect, whether, whether how you observe the community dealing with proof of stake or proof of work and consensus protocols, how the community has addressed issues like uh, privacy, um, even looking at the, the ebbs and flow of ICOs and SDOs, you know, what have we learnt over the last 10 years with this, uh, I guess, uh, with this technology being um, taken out of the, uh, you know, taken out to play. Anyone can go ahead and hop on that first one. Yeah, sure, I can take it. Um, so, as I said, I've only been in this space for 25% of the time that Bitcoin has existed. So, I'm still a relative noob. Um, but, I mean, we were talking before about uh, the changes in protocols and the disagreements that exist across um, different camps. Um, and I think what's happening here is that people are competing in this very impressive marketplace of ideas. Um, but I think really we're all fighting the same fight. We all want to solve exactly the same problems. We want to improve scalability, we want to improve usability, UX and UI has a huge problem. Um, and I think what's interesting about that is that, as I said before, I'm really interested in driving user adoption. And when I'm talking to consumers and merchants, Intimate.io has um, a merchant ecosystem of more than 45 partners across the world in the adult industry, and they really don't care what's going on. It's really important that we have um, incredible people working on these uh, fundamental technologies and protocols to make it work, but my interest is how do I bundle that up and hide it behind the hood so that people don't have to worry about it? So. Interesting things with that, if you're actually running a business, like my, my customers, they want to know how can I improve conversion rates and close a customer when their credit card declines. That's what I'm interested in. They really don't want to know about forks. It's still an important thing that goes on behind the community. Um, but for them, they want to know, I just want to implement an easy to use solution and I don't want to have to learn too much. And I think that's totally fine. I mean, these days, if someone had an amazing e-commerce solution and they said, you know what, I'm going to go set something up, I'm going to set up a great website, I'm going to sell dresses. And you turn around and said, you know what, do you know how the internet works? Because I think what we need to do is start bundling it up. But we're still at a pretty early stage. Um, and I guess what I've learned is that we need to be putting out those MVPs so that people can start using it, testing it. Where are the sticking points? How can we smooth this out and get more people actually using the currencies so that we can start to see it scaling across the world from a user adoption perspective? Okay. Yeah, cool. Just to build on that, um, totally agree. Um, and I think at the fundamental level of people that want to be involved in the peak under the hood and want to um, help kind of bring this technology to fruition, like the underlying infrastructure in general, um, there isn't enough capacity building. So there are people that, that don't want or need to know how something works, and that's fine. There are people that now have an opportunity that has never existed before to be part um, of a technology solution um, vision that doesn't just have one or two stakeholders that have um, the, the important sort of uh, jet-lagged guys running out of things to say. The, that don't have necessarily um, all of the control, I guess is what I'll say. So there are many stakeholders at different levels um, and different understandings and, and like different levels of complexity um, in their understanding and each of them has a part to play. And that's incredibly important, but 
unfortunately, um, I don't think we're harnessing that power as much as we could be at the moment. And what I really want to work on this year, because I think we're at a point where this is critical now, where there have been experts that have been really loud, and now they're gone, and there are empty seats, and I just want to have a conversation now about um, what capacity building looks like. What do people need to know to trust this? What do the people that want to be part of this tech world, that want to be part of this disruptive solution but don't understand it and feel that the barrier uh, to entry is too high, what do they need in order to um, join the, the you know, product design and UX and um, manager side and all of the other important kind of roles that come together? And if you zoom out, like this is just a problem that will continue to be a people problem and technology will not solve it. So that's what I'm interested in tackling this year. And, and I want to hear the honest conversations and really peel back the, it's going to be great, kind of hype around it and just stop the bullshit. Sorry for the Can swearing. I just add to that? I, I totally agree with you. And that's why um, from the very beginning, Intimate.io has been blockchain agnostic because we want to be able to shield our token holders in our community from anything that might disrupt their use and their, the usual running of their business. Um, so whichever protocol wins out, whichever becomes the industry standard, we will adopt it. We just want the best solution for our customers. So we're really coming at it from that perspective and kind of relying on people like Jimmy <laughs> to, um, to go out there and fight that war of ideas to uh, help us understand what's actually going to be the best thing to be hidden under the hood. <laughs> And I'd rather have a respectful debate about these kinds of things or, or different opinions but have transparency, true transparency, and an opportunity to rebuild or reconnect than sit there and agree that some use case that is a million years away because no one knows how to build it yet is going to happen. So yeah, totally agree with you. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I've come to a realization after being in the space for a while is that um, Bitcoin and, and most blockchains are not anonymous. They're, they're pseudo-anonymous. And that's a very big difference, uh, and a lot of people don't understand it. A lot of people were sold the idea very early on that uh, Bitcoin was a private currency uh, and that only drug dealers used it. Um, I don't really know who came up with that idea, but Bitcoin's about the worst bloody thing you could use for drug money in the entire world. Um, so there are... Cash is still the ultimate privacy yeah, coin. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know, Bitcoin is a public blockchain, so every coin that you send across the blockchain is tracked and traceable forever. And once you interact with a point in public, like an exchange, which most people use, then you've got your identity tracked to your coins, basically. Um, so it, it, at, least where, at least where I work, um, privacy is a massive and important part of things. Um, and it's led to the development of new protocols, for example, the CryptoNote protocol, which we're based off. Um, that try and add more privacy to transactions. I don't know if Bitcoin's going to be able to do privacy at a base layer. There are some interesting technologies out there like confidential transactions which add uh, elements of privacy, but I don't know if they're going to be able to do it at a base layer. So I think we might need to have an additional solution for private cur currency. Um, and that's really kind of what we're working on. But that's like the biggest realization that I've come to is that most people really don't understand the difference between private cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. They think they're the same thing. Um, I would say the lesson I've learned the most, and it's what I talk about a lot um, when I do public speaking, is that it's time for Bitcoin and the blockchain industry generally to grow up. Uh, and I mean several things by that. One, I mean that it's time for Bitcoin development and the ecosystem to professionalize. I think there are a lot of great people out there with some interesting projects out there. But for this to really grow into a world currency and world blockchain, you need to professionalize the development of it um, with a more professional business plan, right? Not just nice projects. A more professional development approach than we've seen in Bitcoin's history. One example is what we're doing with Bitcoin SV. When we created the client software, our team sat down and said, what are the things that other major technology companies and sectors do to ensure that their software is top class, has high quality assurance, and is really secure, especially the most security sensitive industries like military and aerospace. So we implemented QA processes in our team's plan to do that. We engaged, with the help of CoinGeek financially, a, an outside security audit firm in the United States called Trail of Bits, former black hat, hat hackers turned white hat hackers, who are conducting a full security audit of the Bitcoin SV node software, which we believe is the first time any Bitcoin node implementation software has ever been security audited. Because it costs money and time, but we're trying to apply a much more professionalized approach to it. Because we know that's necessary to get companies 
that don't know anything about Bitcoin, just what you've been talking about, how do we get them comfortable and confident using it, to actually use it from a, both a merchant perspective, because they hear all these scary stories about hacks and things, as well as for, as an enterprise um, blockchain for their enterprise applications. It also means taking a different philosophy to grow up in what Bitcoin is, and it goes a lot to this question of is it a privacy coin or an anonymity coin. We're different than the other Bitcoin camps because we recognize Bitcoin provides privacy, but it does not, as you said, provide anonymity. Nor was it ever intended to, nor do we think it should. Because when people want anonymity, some of the proponents in other Bitcoin camps who want that, if they're honest, they want it to allow marketplaces to do pretty much anything and buy anything you want. Which, of course, goes down a terrible black market path that would be antithetical to growing Bitcoin as a world sound money system that governments and big businesses and all of you around the world can rely on. If you believe in the day that Bitcoin will be extremely valuable, then it has to be used all around the world by billions of people and by major businesses for their applications. So that its value actually has real value, not the speculative value we've been seeing going up and down the last couple of years. That's the only way it has real value in, with its utility. And that means embracing the fact that regulation will apply not to the Bitcoin blockchain or network itself, but to businesses that operate on it. Just like laws and regulations apply to businesses that operate on the internet. Um, so we take a very regulation-friendly and government-friendly mindset into everything we do, which creates a lot of flack from other people in other Bitcoin camps, which don't like that. They don't want anything regulated, to which I say, you know what? It's going to happen. We can either pretend that's not going to happen, or if we want the world using this, we need to embrace it. So an example of that is we ran a tokenization solution competition last year with CoinGeek to award a five million pound prize to a team that could design a top tier token solution that's now exclusive to the Bitcoin SV chain. The team that won actually is largely based here in Australia. It's called Tokenized, and the protocol is at tokenized.cash. One of the reasons our team was impressed with their solution wasn't just because it could deliver a lot of tokens. They support approximately 50 different asset types for real world tokens, not just ICO type things. Securities, stock, bonds, coupons, event tickets, airline tickets could be tokenized in their protocol. But they designed into their system ways for any token issuer as a business to comply with local laws in their jurisdiction that would apply to the token, whether it's securities law, money transmissions law, or anything else. Because they recognize no business is going to want to operate on their token protocol if it's not going to be compliant with local laws. You're not going to get businesses to do it. So we take a very uh, 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 government-friendly ethos, not because I want Bitcoin or the blockchain to be overly regulated, I don't, but as a former lawyer, I know businesses are going to have to comply with whatever laws and whatever jurisdictions they operate and live in. And so instead of running away from that, we need to just grow up and accept that that's going to happen. And that's why we don't want our blockchain to be one that's designed for black market transactions. Um, and that's why we believe in the privacy of the Bitcoin blockchain and its transactions, but we don't believe in a world of anonymity. And if people want to create that, then that's their business, but that's not what we believe Bitcoin needs to achieve a truly global status. Um, those are some of the ways where we think the Bitcoin and blockchain world needs to sort of start growing up and professionalizing in its approach to how uh, things are done. So I wouldn't mind just uh, getting into this uh, privacy discussion a little bit, because um, uh, Leah made a really good presentation yesterday, I saw it Paul. So were there anything you wanted to share about your views on, on privacy? And yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've talked a little bit about what Intimate.io is doing in the space of payments, and that's our big focus at the moment, because through rolling out our payments network and ensuring that we have users that are transacting through our payment gateway, that's how we actually get to the next stage or uh, the next horizon of our project, which is building our trust technologies. Um, and that's all around pseudonymity. So I'm really glad that you brought it up because um, we're really excited about the power of pseudonymity as opposed to anonymity. Um, particularly within the space of the adult industry where there's few industries, I guess you mentioned drugs, but um, <laughs> the adult industry is one of the few where people are very, very protective of their privacy. Um, I don't know about you, but you probably not run and told everyone uh, when you've just bought porn or a vibrator or perhaps engaged in an escort. It's something that people really want to keep private. The problem with that, however, is that someone else is always going to draw at the short end of the straw. 
So, for example, if I use um, in New South Wales, um, sex work is decriminalised, and if you're trying to establish trust with a new client, your service provider, you want to be able to validate certain attributes of their identity against other existing information. Now, that client's going to be very hesitant to give you that information. So, generally, you're going to have to find some other kind of trust measure. And I've spent the past year working with sex workers to understand how do they establish trust with someone that they've never met before and they're about to go and see and exchange money for sex. And by and large, one of the most effective measures they've told me is I listen to their voice, on the, uh, the sound of their voice on the phone. I mean, to me, that's, that's not enough. And the important thing is, is that we have to actually contrast this to the rise and rise of online dating. So it's actually, right swipers could learn a lot from sex workers <laughs> because I'm sure you've all had a one night stand or, you know, perhaps nobody really wants to admit that, but a lot of people <laughs> are, are meeting. I'll admit it. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for being honest. Just one? <laughs> It's just a cheeky one. <laughs> but, but it's true. I mean, people are jumping into bed with people when they really know nothing about them. And very young people are using dating apps like Tinder and Bumble, and they have no trust system to be able to measure whether that person they're about to jump into bed with is safe, is trustworthy, is, you know, do they have an STI? Do they practice safe sex? Are they going to be violent? I mean, if you look at other um, apps across the world, it's really not that long ago that if I said to you, I'm just about to jump in a stranger's car and they're going to drive me home, or I'm going to go halfway around the world and stay in a stranger's house overnight, you'd be like, are you fucking crazy? But reputation systems have allowed us to trust complete strangers. And the pendulum has kind of swung to this other way now where perhaps we're even too trusting. Like, do you look at your Uber driver's rating before you jump in the car? No, because you trust Uber to look after that for you. So we've kind of gone from to these peer-to-peer -peer systems where we're actually still trusting a centralised body to manage that trust measurement for us, which is kind of scary, and it actually goes against the whole purpose of the experiment. So I think what's... Um, oh, and just another point on that too. If I've been using Uber for a few years and I've built up an effective trust measure to show that you can trust me to jump in your car and I'm not going to projectile vomit or try to kill you or rape you, but I can't take my trust measure and port it over to Airbnb or any other kind of reputation system. And why not? That's my data. I should be able to control that. I should be able to use it wherever it's going to bring me loyalty and reward. But I can't because all these reputation systems are centralised. So I think there's a pretty exciting um, use case for being able to implement a decentralised system, but that isn't anonymous. If it's pseudonymous, we can respect the fact that we have different personas in life, and I really believe in the power of voluntary or selective disclosure of certain attributes around our identity. We should be able to turn them off and on, depending on who or what we're interacting with. So there's stuff, stuff about me that I'm happy to show my mum, but I don't necessarily want to show my escort, and vice versa. That's fine. I think we should be able to control that. Um, but at the moment, nothing like that exists, and I think uh, in terms of pseudonymity, Transparency and immutability is very powerful, um, but we should be able to control it from a user perspective that puts the power back in our hands and not within centralized bodies. Yeah, I might, I might uh, add a point there. I really, really think that pseudo-anonymity is really not enough in any of these systems. And it's not just for the people that are buying drugs online. It's for people who are actually doing legitimate transactions in business. So for example, if I'm transacting with someone and I have an account as a business person and someone knows how much is in my account, they know I have $20 million worth of Bitcoin, then that's, gonna, that's going to uh, affect the way they negotiate with me. They know I have $20 million so that they can leverage that against me. It's very, very, very difficult in a pseudo-anonymity system to hide your transaction graph, even if you use mixes, like it's very difficult. I think we actually need true anonymity and I think it needs to be not opt-in, it needs to be across the whole transaction base. I'm, I get very scared when people talk about reputation systems because I feel like they're going to be applied 
across like across users unfairly. We're already seeing what's happening in China, where they're developing reputation systems for people, and then uh, basically charging them additional money to increase their reputation if it goes below a certain point. I really think these systems can be misused, and we should be very careful with them. Um, building a network of, of of reputation systems that you can transact across, I I just don't think it should be done. I think it's a slippery slope. Can Can I add to that, if I may? Um, I, I agree with you, and um, I hear the same thing all the time. Uh, Pete, the other one that people like to bring up is Black Mirror and um, that episode around social popularity and how it relates to the kind of interest rate that you get on your new house. Um, and it's interesting because we've been having discussions internally about, well, how do we tackle that? Because, no, we don't want to build systems like that. I think what I'm interested in, in is more validation of trust. So how do you actually measure whether someone is trustworthy and specifically within the space of in-person interactions? Um, so reputation is a funny word, you know, if you speak to people within the space that are building reputation algorithms, they don't really mind. Um, but when you talk to consumers and how this is going to apply to their life, it's a word that um, generates real fear. Um, so I think, too, we need to be critical um, and think about the ethics applied to these systems. Um, and that goes for all privacy systems. At the moment, we're building technologies that are going to, sh to shape the future world that we live in. And sometimes it's difficult to understand what that's going to look like. So we need to be having more debates like this to understand, well, how do we build something now that's ethical and positive soci for societies and not some nightmarish thing like the Chinese government rollout? Um, let me address your point about anonymity. Um, because I do agree there are both lawful and unlawful usages of anonymous transactions. It's not like every anonymous desire to be, you know, have an anonymous transaction is inherently unlawful. Um, our view of it is differently, is that you know, Bitcoin's goal originally was to create a new world money system. To have a new world money system that enough people have confidence to use and that businesses and governments have confidence to use is not going to happen with a fully anonymous system. So it isn't that there can't be legitimate usages of anonymous digital currency system. It's that, in my view, that's too limiting because you will not get the confidence of the biggest enterprises and institutions in our world that will have concerns about a fully anonymous system. You what, about an anonymous what about something like cash, though? Like, cash is fairly anonymous, and people have used it for a long time. It, 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 cash is fairly anonymous, but now that we live in a digital world, right, um, it's used increasingly less, right? And for people who have significant cash businesses, one of the challenges, I'm gonna give you an example. Somebody contacted me last year at Enchain and said, oh, maybe you at Enchain can help us. We had know someone who has a lot of cash. We can't tell you how they have all this cash, but it's stored at all of these ports and places in Italy and Spain and wherever, and they can't move it. And they can't put it in a bank because the bank's going to know where it comes from, right, before they'll deposit that volume of cash. We're talking millions and millions of dollars. So maybe, Enchain, you could help them convert it to Bitcoin, and then they can like send it around the world and transact with it. To which I said, no, I don't want to help you with that. <laughs> um, and it's so that cash has a valid purpose, but the times when people accumulate large portions of it um, and then want to transact with it in normal, everyday manners is difficult when it comes from an illegitimate source. Um, and so our world financial system has moved so much into digital transmission, right, of finances, that it makes it hard to create any real world digital currency system that has full anonymity because of the KYC and AML requirements that our financial systems impose. And obviously Bitcoin kind of gets around some of those to some extent, but not fully anymore with the exchanges you know, expecting to have to KYC people. So my point isn't that there aren't, look, there are perfectly legitimate usages of an anonymous digital currency system. But if we want a currency system to really become a global one, I don't think that's gonna happen with an anonymous system. You could have an anonymous system that has a more narrow usage uh, in the digital currency world. It's just that our desire is to create the world's new money, and we don't think that's gonna happen if it's fully anonymous. Yeah, I, I don't know if I fully agree with that. I feel like we adopted cash and we had cash around for a long time. And I don't think just because we've gone into a digital landscape that necessarily people are afraid of anonymity now. I think it's about having controls 
Um, and there will always be this idea of having exchanges, centralized exchanges, which KYC people into the, into the um, cryptocurrency. And the other thing is about having auditability. So for example, with Monero, although all of the transaction, uh, transactions are private, you also have a view key, which you can give to auditors for them to be able to check the transactions that are in your wallet. So it's not always just about, you know, it's my way or the highway. There are solutions that are in between as well, where you can prove that you're holding a certain amount of cryptocurrency, investigate. But is that really anonymous or is that just not pseudonymous? No, it's, it's reveal... anonymous, but it's, volu it's voluntarily uh, de-anonymized by giving away your view key. Like there's, there's an option, like it should always be voluntary on the person's basis about whether they give away their privacy or not. That's what I feel. Like it should be up to you whether you give away your privacy or not. It shouldn't be up to the government who, who has uh, control of everyone's privacy. And that's, that's kind of closer to the vision of like the crypto note uh, vision, which is like, yeah, you have this view key that you can voluntarily give away, which removes your privacy. And I think that's the difference between our mindset and a lot of other people in the cryptocurrency world, which want that. And our view is if you create that, that's fine. It's not going to become global currency. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's a free marketplace of ideas. So we're going to see what becomes the most popular. Final note on privacy. This is so refreshing to me. I've never heard um, in the world that I come from, which every conversation uh, with a new client as a product manager that I would hear was, we want to do something with Bitcoin or blockchain. What are those again? Or just, we want to find a use case because we've heard that this is the thing to get onto. And I felt like every conversation I had was just hammers looking for nails and everything was philosophizing around these grandiose ideas of how supply chains would somehow have this level of transparency, but yet the, the corporates behind them would still have the ability to just carry on as they always have under the guise of acting differently. And um, to hear a conversation in which there is a healthy debate, in which there is honesty around the complexities of things like anonymity, privacy, the difference between the two, um, and, and everything that goes into actually changing business as usual, which I'm not interested in doing with a disruptive technology, um, is like, that means more to me than any of the hype around like responsible supply chains ever did. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn um, on the social impact side of things when it comes to um, being transparent and it's incredibly dangerous to act like you are doing something good when you are just finding um, ways to like harness a, tra a permission blockchain, for example, for evil, um, or act like you are part of an ecosystem of change when you are just insidiously um, undermining everything that that ecosystem is supposed to be fighting back against. So thank you so much for giving me hope because I feel like this is the beginning of the actual work. Can I just add to that too? Because it's so interesting. We've, we've, I'm sure we all have flown all around the world having these conversations. And the topic of privacy and anonymity is really fascinating depending on who you're talking to, what environment, what landscape, what jurisdiction. In places like Australia, I mean, we all have bank accounts. I think AUD is like the fifth traders traded currency in the world. It's an in-demand currency. We can all get a line of credit. We can all get a mortgage. We believe in our political, Not judicial, in, in financial systems. Not in the Philippines. In the Philipp Philippines, this is a nation of more than 105 million people. 31% of those are banked. But 68% of them, sorry, 58% of them have a smartphone. But only 4% of transactions happen online. Now over there, you've got this incredible emerging blockchain scene that are creating some of the most amazing technologies in the world and are seeing rapid adoption because people need the solution. Like coins.ph, for example, is an amazing wallet that was just acquired a few weeks ago for I think like 78 million or something. It's only four years old. It's achieved 5% adoption out of 105 million population. That's phenomenal. And I'll tell you why. Because the people who are using it, they don't have adequate ID documents. They don't have a bank account. They've never had a digital transaction solution. And they can open a coins.ph wallet with little more than an email. And they can populate it with Bitcoin or Ethereum, or they can go down to the 7-Eleven and deposit cash into their digital wallet. And for the first time, they can make digital transactions. So I really think that it's going to be places like that where issues around privacy, anonymity, ID, they actually affect real people in their everyday lives and prevent them from progressing 
that's where we're going to see these technologies rise. And the reason the Philippines regulators have allowed businesses like that to emerge because they need to be licensed in the Philippines is because those transactions are not fully anonymous. Mm. Yeah. So necessi sorry, necessity yeah. breeds innovation more than anything else. And when you don't have, um, when there are people that are very comfortable with the, the status quo, like for example, corporates that are um, not sure where their gemstones come from and would rather not know, there isn't a necessity um, or at least enough to drive that kind of innovation. So that's, an, yeah, it's incredible to hear practical use cases that actually make sense and could happen now. No, we're spoiled in the Western countries because yeah, we take yeah. bank accounts and credit cards and paying for things online for granted. But when you, you know, I travel a lot and speak a lot in the Philippines or we spoke in Rwanda last year, you know, you have countries where 86% of the population has no bank account. And once they have no bank account, they have no access to the financial services we take for granted, a credit card, being able to get a loan, paying for your bills online, being able to withdraw money in another country out of an ATM. Uh, those are all things we take for granted that um, can't exist for them, but can with you know, cryptocurrencies. Um, but in those countries, the, the governments the, to allow the emergence of exchanges and wallet operators um, are you know, taking a regulatory look at them. And that's why we think that I go back to the point of for a true global currency to emerge, it has to live in this world um, that likes, will tolerate pseudonymity, but is a lot more skeptical of anonymity. Just even the word trust, I mean, that gets chucked around so much in the blockchain scene. People talk about it so much, but it's really a, a complex idea that I think people in Western progressive countries totally take for granted. But when you're at the bottom of the transparency index, which is a measure of corruption in your country, trust is something that is just not within reach for you, with your government, with the people around you. So it's a totally different environment. And I think for trust technologies, that's a pretty interesting place um, to start experimenting with those. So we might uh, go to questions now before I ask a final question uh, of the panel. So. You know, let's get into some of the questions that you had um, in mind as we were talking through uh, all the things. So if you don't mind just coming up here, because uh, grab one of the microphones. We'd like to hear it for the camera. Uh, it'll be great. Jess, uh, do you want to just down get ready as well? If you've got a question, question, just come up and get ready. Also, uh, I do, just to add this is, I do understand some people are a bit, uh, Concerned or sensitive about being on camera and asking the question, so if you do want to go to the back and raise your hands later, I'll just go over there and ask for you if you don't want to be on camera. Oh, is my hair good enough to be on camera? You look beautiful. Oh, thank you. My leg is not very good. Uh, my, f my question is first directed to your gen the gentleman in the middle. Your name is Andy, right? Jimmy. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Sorry. I'm Sebastian, by the way, and certainly would welcome comments from the rest of the panel. Um, because I came late, so I didn't hear what you said in the past. But from what, based on what I heard so far, either one of the comments you made was you keep saying that the the big world of commercial um, bankers, let me use that word, would not tolerate complete uh, animosity. I think not animosity. What's anonymity. Word? Anonymity. Thank you. And I think you also make a a throwaway statements like, no, they, there will be concerns. Perhaps you wouldn't mind just giving us some examples of what those concerns would be, uh, um, just to illustrate sure. the point why they won't like that. Well, thank you. Under current laws of pretty much every jurisdiction, if you run any type of money service business, right, a business that holds and transmits money that, uh, on behalf of customers, you're holding custody of customer money, um, you need a regulatory license. And as part of that regulatory license, you're required to do certain things, which is to, when you onboard a customer, get certain information from the customer, right? To verify their identity, their address, they are who they are. Um, and same thing, and, and so those laws were written before the cryptocurrency world are being interpreted for the cryptocurrency world. And a lot of jurisdictions require an exchange, a cryptocurrency exchange, to essentially comply with those exact same laws or similar ones that are written for cryptocurrency. So New York in the United States has a special what they call bit license. So if you're a virtual currency business, you need to comply with that. And the point of it is that governments want any business that offers services to consumers in the virtual currency space to act as if they were money services businesses, which means getting information about the customer. So in a lot of places, you can't open an exchange account without providing such information. 
which tells you that governments of the world are fine with the cryptocurrency emergence, but they want the businesses that operate exchanges and other services to comply with know your customer as well as AML anti-money laundering requirements. So it's not because I think it's right or wrong. I just think it's the reality of the world in which we live. And the other th reason that we're seeing this as valuable is we want businesses to comply with responsible consumer expectations. What's happening in Canada with Quadriga right now, the exchange, which just had to seek bankruptcy protection because their founder supposedly died in India, mysteriously, and created a system where he was the only person who had access to the private keys for all of the customers in, I guess, the hot wallet, right? Or was it the cold wallet? And so now the company can access almost $200 million worth of customers' cryptocurrency. In a regulated world, that company would have been audited along the way and that would have been detected as a problem. That's a security problem. So that's my point. It's not because I don't agree there aren't reasons people want anonymous transactions which can be perfectly legitimate. But if we want normal people outside of this room to feel comfortable using cryptocurrency who've never heard of a Bitcoin address or don't know about these protocol wars, we want them to use it and you want your mom to be able to like feel comfortable. You know, we live in a world where we have to make Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies um, uh, compliant with what governments and our financial institutions and normal people would expect. Because they think of it as a form of money and, and I think there can be a space for anonymous coins. I just think it's going to be hard for them to become a global currency. I'll just point out that um, we've uh, addressed about five questions. Now I can see that we've got about ten questions coming. Um, so what we're going to try and do, we, we want to answer them all. So if I can ask the panel to answer sure. very, very promptly to all the questions and obviously keep uh, the <coughs> questions short as well, then hopefully we can you know, have a conversation with everyone. So speed questioning. Speed, speed it's, it's going to be speed aiding, speed questioning very soon. Hi, my name's Chris. Hey guys, thanks for the, the panel session. Um, this might be getting a little bit repetitive because um, <laughs> it's been covered before, but I just want to, I'm just missing something. Um, Jimmy, the, you seem to be sort of resistant to promoting privacy, um, which is really strange to me because I would think that uh, if you're trying to set things up for businesses um, and normal people, that you would want the only people to know about the transaction is the first business, the business they transacted with, and the government or the regulator. Nobody else. Why would anybody else and why should anybody else know? Uh, well, I didn't ever say that I would want a system where everybody else would know what transactions you have. It depends what you mean by privacy versus anonymity. Uh, Bitcoin has privacy built in, which means when I send a Bitcoin transaction, the only thing that you can detect publicly on the ledger is coins went from one address to another address. You don't know automatically who owns those wallet addresses, right? There's ways you could trace and try and tie back to people, but you don't necessarily know with absolute certainty, right? And, um, and so that creates a privacy function, but it's not anonymous. And the reason we don't believe in full anonymity is if there is a problem with a transaction, let's say it's used for illegal purposes, then a government law enforcement agency is going to want to be able to try to detect who are the parties to that transaction. And if you're an exchange that somehow sits in the middle while you wouldn't normally disclose it, in a law enforcement world, they're going to want to be able to subpoena an exchange and say, tell me who had that wallet address. And if we want it to be used as real money and grow globally, I would think you would want um, law enforcement agencies to be able to do that. So I don't want a system where you could look at the blockchain and, and anyone can determine who the parties to the transaction are and what the amounts are. But I do think it will only grow if there's a system where, when absolutely necessary, the identities could be determined. Did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in. I think maybe the points you're presenting are antithetical, though. Like, once you have your, the Bitcoin system, you have massive problems with anonymity. Like, even if you do have pseudo anonymity, people use protocols in ways that are nonsensical. This is why tools like chain analysis 
uh, uh, there's Blockseer, like these uh, tools exist to look at the connections between multiple addresses. Like the US government is now funding chain analysis to the tune of $250,000 a year to use these tools to analyze the movement of funds through the blockchain. I mean, I really don't think you can have one or the other. You have to make a decision and it has to be the best way to do it in, in what you're, and what you're sounding like is that you would like opt-in privacy, which is not as good as applying privacy across the whole transaction set, but at least you have some protection on the transactions that you prefer to be private. So I'd like to see like Bitcoin, for example, introduce like uh, a zero knowledge proof system on top. Maybe it doesn't need to be at the protocol level, right? Uh, maybe you can introduce zero knowledge proofs or you can do ring signatures on another layer as well, just using opcode probably. Um, but you know, like it, you can't, I feel like the, the points you're saying are anth antithetical. I don't think you can have uh, just pseudo anonymity and protect everyone who is on the chain. Right, but it's better than the financial system you have today where if I send a wire transfer, the parties to the wire transfer and the transfer service know who the parties are. But and if I send a, any bank deposit or transfer above a certain amount, the bank must report it to the government. But it's not better than a wire though because it happens on the public chain. Like everyone right, can but, see the transaction. But in, the wire, in the wire, only my bank, me and probably the government can see the transfer. Yeah, except, I mean, the difference is, look, the Bitcoin system, like I said, if you want to create a system with anonymity, go for it. I just don't think it's going to become a global currency. Okay, let's move to the next question. Uh, thanks very much for that. That was great uh, forum discussion. Um, my question, given the theme of today, is about the future of Bitcoin. Um, I think uh, most of us recognise that there are a multiplicity of coins currently in the market. There's unlikely to be a reduction in the number anytime soon. In fact, they're more likely to be increasing numbers of coins in, into the, the, the near future anyway. I guess my question is, um, how important do you think uh, interoperability is going to be in terms of being able to transact between different types of coins in the future? Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be uh, fairly important. I think we're going to see a large consolidation, and I actually think that that's already happening. You're starting to see the Reddit threads every day of the cryptocurrency companies dropping off the edge of the earth and exit scamming, and I think that's going to be continual until we see maybe another bull run, and maybe people will be smarter about how they use their money um, the second time around, hopefully. Um, but I think we will still see maybe one, or th one two to, to ten blockchains that are in the top, um, I don't think it's going to be one blockchain that's going to rule the world, unfortunately, um, because then we could all sit on them. So I think interoperability will be important. I know that there's a ton of blockchain companies looking at, for example, atomic swaps um, to trade between the two currencies. I think that's a, that's a cool feature that, that should be supported. Next question. Uh, question for Jimmy. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jimmy. Um, Bitcoin SV, over the next, you mentioned that you feel it will be the, the dominant blockchain. Um, how do you see it like the next 10 years with Bitcoin SV in terms of, do you think it'll be within 10 years that that would happen or? That's a tough question. It's going to take time. I, I think if we can't accomplish some of our goals in the next two to five years, it, the next two to three years are critical for, for the life of Bitcoin. So we have to accomplish a lot in the next two to three and certainly five years or, or it's not going to happen. Um, and the reason I believe it'll be the dominant one is that it's the only one which has the commitment to the massive scaling that's necessary to be a global enterprise blockchain. The other blockchain and cryptocurrency projects either don't have that desire, right? Bitcoin Core doesn't have that desire, right? Or they have scaling and security issues such as Ethereum's been, you know, facing. So um, it's, it's that we, we have that philosophy and we're committed to it. But uh, I think we have a lot of work to do the next couple of years and our focus immediately is on scaling and getting enterprise applications uh, onto BSV. Uh, hi, uh, another question for Jimmy, but everyone's uh, welcome to comment. Um, so you spoke about Satoshi's vision being peer-to-peer uh, -peer digital, decentralized digital cash. Um, so rather than the future of blockchain, let's talk about the history of money for a second. Um, it's uh, quite accepted, or maybe you might challenge this, but um, 
the history of money, certainly spoken by, by Nick Zabo, uh, people like Vijay Boyapati, is um, one that really moves from a stage of collectible to store of value, through store of value to medium of exchange. This is where I see cash sitting, then medium of exchange to unit of account. So if you're trying to just insert Bitcoin SV as cash immediately, what, what part of that monetary history do you disagree with? And then why do you feel you can circumvent the collectible and the store of value phase and go straight to cash? Thanks. Um, well, I don't think every attempt at money has to follow the same chronology because Bitcoin was birthed not to follow that, right? If you go back and look at Bitcoin's creation, uh, the white paper and what it was designed to do, it never intended in the beginning to be a collectible. It might have been, right? Um, and I think uh, Bitcoin was never intended to be just a store of value. Um, it was designed initially to be electronic cash. You could cheaply and quickly you know, transact around the world. So it's not so much that I view it as trying to insert SV into any part of that chronology. Um, we just focus on what we believe its utility should be which is as electronic cash and how it gets there along the way. I don't particularly care. I view those earlier stages have already happened with the legacy of the whole Bitcoin blockchain, which has taken too long to get to the point. We, we should have been where we're at years ago. Um, so it's life as a collectible and as a store of value have already happened with the earlier portions of the chain on Bitcoin Core. All right, just before I go to the next one, I am going even there, but do, I'll do two questions here. Two questions over there. Are any of your questions directed towards somebody other than Jimmy? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, go, Esther. <laughs> so, this panel is about Bitcoin, at least when I came in here. Um, but I, I was interested to see how. Okay, it is kind of directed to Jimmy, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> every, everybody, everybody is free to comment, but um, it just got me thinking what Jimmy said about uh, Bitcoin SV as a attempt for a restoration to the original vision of Bitcoin and um, as a global currency, uh, uh, for an attempt to make it a global currency, they have to address the issue about scalability. But um, I feel as important is what strides do you think people are making to help corporations understand the benefit of using Bitcoin in the first place? The big difference is our camp actually goes and talks to big corporations, which is something that I, about the usage of BSV, not just as a cryptocurrency, but as a blockchain. We've been doing it since its birth. I've just had a couple of calls over the last days while I'm here with companies that approach Enchain as a development, reach a development business about trying to test out pilots for usage of it for digital advertising. I talked to a company in Japan recently who wants to try something in the property tech field, which I didn't even know that was a field, right? I just got uh, an email today about a company that wants to explore something with tokenizing airline tickets on BSV. So the big difference is honestly that we actually will go talk to big companies about using it. That's not something the Bitcoin Cash ABC camp really did or cared about. And it's not really what Bitcoin Core cared about <laughs> apart from you know, the Lightning Network in terms of enterprise usage. So to me, that's the biggest difference. We actually purposely discuss BSV as an enterprise blockchain and go actively talk to big companies. I feel like uh, Roger Ver would disagree with you, right? I think he was one of the biggest pushers of Bitcoin, even when it was just Bitcoin Core. He went out and talked to tons of people about accepting Bitcoin um, at their business. I think he did as a currency, but not necessarily at the biggest enterprises. He certainly talked to a lot of merchants, and I have a lot of respect for Roger. It's one of the biggest, I think, um, disappointments of having fought this hash war and this split is I actually like Roger a lot. Uh, he talked to a lot of merchants. I, the big difference is we're focused on enterprise usage um, at the biggest companies and for blockchain technology uses, not just as a payment method. I feel like maybe they've only really become very recently interested in this kind of stuff with the, the growth of Ethereum and smart contracts and seeing what they can do with the blockchain. Bingo. I think um, Bitcoin Cash is developer groups. One of the disagreements we've had with, you know, they kept wanting to add things into the protocol as a very much 
well, Ethereum's got that, so we needed to add something in here to do that. And our view is like, you can do that, but you don't need to change the protocol for it. There's yeah, ways to do it. You can do a lot with opcodes. Right, exactly. We, we just think if you restore the Satoshi opcodes, you could do it with existing Satoshi opcodes and in script and not change the core design. Next question. Uh, I'll address my question to Key, but Jimmy, you, you have, probably have an interest in answering it too. <laughs> uh, apologies. Thanks for your knowledge insights so far. Um, my background is in governance, so how do we do good governance about the, uh, the blockchains? In, pa me. in particular, <laughs> we can talk afterwards. In particular, how do we do <laughs> about governance? Um, how do we do good governance consistent with Satoshi's vision? You touched upon that, J Jimmy, and trying to uh, bring around, bring about Satoshi's vision with SV. If, however, you're evolving SV to up to scaling it up to one gigabyte block sizes, all of a sudden the kind of nodes that will be carrying those one gigabyte block sizes, they're probably data centers. I'm not running one gigabyte blocks and my home node, for example. So no sooner do you move to data centers, all of a sudden this vision of a decentralized set of nodes, of a trustless mechanism, is, is lost. You are moving to a centralized system. So my question then is, you're undermining the vision, but you're also trying to pursue the vision. How do you reconcile the two, and why scale that large anyway? I disagree that going to data centers and having larger mining groups means you've centralized the network. And there is, if you go back and read early Satoshi writings, Satoshi made very clear that Satoshi, he, she, they envisioned a future of data farms and centers. That's very clear from some of the early Satoshi bulletin posts. And it means you're going to have mining groups that are larger, or corporations, but there will be multiple ones of them. This is not a situation where I view a day where there's just gonna be one mining group. It means, yeah, you're not gonna probably have home node users being the, the main miners on the network. And some people don't like that. So people want to preserve a network where individuals can mine and, can, and, and are important miners on the network. In our view, you, if you, that's not going to achieve a global currency. And um, it's just a different philosophy. And if people want to support a cryptocurrency that has a mining network that is designed for home users, they're free to do it. Um, we just don't think that, it's pretty clear if you go back and read the early Satoshi writings. The network was meant to scale much bigger than Visa levels back in 2009, 2010. Satoshi predicted that improvements in hardware would essentially lead to a future of like data server farms. Um, so we're not doing anything that wasn't there, just people didn't want to pay attention to that because I think there's this belief, and I understand why, that you know, it started with people running the server mining nodes in their homes and garages and that's the way it should stay. And that's just, we just think differently. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have to say it's, it's probably like a scale, right? So if you start with a one megabyte block, then you're probably going to be able to serve the whole entire network. And as you scale up and put more and more uh, data through the network, it's just uh, it's, it's bandwidth and storage space and compute power that limit you, right? So it depends on how many nodes you want to have on your network and how decentralized you want it to be. And that's the slider, basically. You can slide it to a certain length and then you'll have you know, only data center people running nodes. I think the idea behind SV is that you still have this idea of um, simple payment verification, right? So you can still know that your transaction is Correct. included in the chain. And their idea is that you have competition between these larger miners, which kind of enforces the ecosystem going forward. I don't know if that's going to work in practice. We'll see. Like, I think we'll see uh, if it works in practice. But there are a lot of people on the other side who say that really you need to run your own node and trust, trust not uh, verify, sorry, trust not verify, you know? So like you need to actually check the blockchain yourself by downloading it, verifying all of the blocks are correct. Um, it, it's, a, it's a half and half. I don't really have a big view on this. I'm not a big blocker or a small blocker. So I'm just going to see where it goes. Our view is, as you said earlier, we have to move to a world where Bitcoin's easy to use, right, and not complicated. Most consumers are not going to want to run their own node at home. Most merchants are not going to want to run their own nodes at home. They're going to want someone else just to do all the work for them. It's how the internet works and why we operate on a single global internet. Our view is a single global public blockchain that's going to require blocks of that scale and, and data mining farms. Hey, my question's for Key. So in terms of like back to anonymous transactions, um, once upon a time, people thought SSL was bad because 
people might use the internet for crime or something. Um, and now, in many places, it's like a legal requirement <clears throat> to have SSL to protect your customers if you're an e-commerce business. Do you think blockchains will go in the same direction where private transactions may become a legal requirement if this infrastructure is, becomes the infrastructure of the future? Yeah, I think that's uh, there's a strong potential there as well. Like uh, you, you see this with um, especially like financial licensing and stuff. There is uh, a certain requirement of privacy, especially that uh, companies keep their users' data private. Um, I don't know how far that extends into the blockchain space. I think we could see a big push from. Uh, companies who are operating on the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, or operating on a public blockchain to get more privacy in. And I don't know how pseudo anonymity is going to change that because you would basically, like, so for example, if I have a blockchain company and I have $150 million of funds, it's very difficult for me to obfuscate where those funds, the origin of those funds are from. For example, if I create another address, I have to transfer the uh, funds from my original address to that other address, and there's a link there, obviously, because it's a blockchain. So getting, like, it seems like a very intractable issue just to do with a, a public blockchain. I think privacy is gonna become more and more important, and I think the privacy that people are gonna want is a, pri a privacy that is auditable in the back end of things. So as I explained before, uh, the crypto note protocol has this idea of a view key. So even though all of the transactions that are happening on the network are private, I can voluntarily let some of my transactions be non-private by exposing the view key for them. Um, so I think it's gonna be this idea of either we opt in to private transactions on layer two, um, or we have an entirely anonymous uh, layer one and then we operate with payment channels potentially on top of that that are, that are non-private. Um, but yeah, I think privacy is going to become an important layer and people are already starting to talk about it as well. Last question. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give an uh, uh, example as Bitcoin, but the question is for the panel. It's probably going to be more a philosophical question at the end of the day. Um, yes, Bitcoin was uh, designed to be decentralized in nature, but if you really look at the reality of it, no one knows who this guy is. He's never come forward. And the first time in the history of the world, there's a multi-billion dollar currency industry, we've got no idea who did it or who designed it at the end of the day, right? This person, right, controls over one million uh, coins still, which is uh, 21 million shares, 5%. That makes that person extremely powerful. And that, in a sense, centralizes power at an unknown scale. I also read we're up to 20 to 30 percent of bitcoins are never going to be found again. People have lost passwords. People have died. What happens? What happens in this? What happens now in the state if you die? If you don't have a will and testament, it goes to the government. It gets redistributed back into society. That person didn't leave the passwords. Pff, gone. It's dead money for the rest of the time, right? So I guess my question to the group is: inherently, anyone can start a cryptocurrency. That the reality is at the end of the day. But if you had the right regulations, do you think philosophically that? Whoever starts that cryptocurrency should be limited to a very finite amount of that total currency to really understand the true purpose was to decentralize power in the currency markets. I mean, if, so, if someone dies then uh, and never touches their keys again, uh, it's like those coins were essentially burned, which increases the value of the rest of the coins. So it's akin to the government putting money back into the ecosystem, I think, maybe just not as targeted. Everyone gets richer when coins get burned. Um, the question about Satoshi having lots of Bitcoin and he'll have Bitcoin on all of these chains presumably as well. I don't think it's so much of an issue. I think he's probably, if, if he's still alive or if they're still alive, I think they're just watching things. If they were financially motivated, they would have sold their Bitcoin during the, the run up, you know, when it was worth a lot of money. So I don't think they're financially motivated. Your question would raise a legitimate concern if Bitcoin was a proof of stake business model rather than a proof of work model. In a proof of stake model, if someone acquired a lot of early coins and therefore a big percentage of the stake in the network, they would have more voting power. This is why we resist moving Bitcoin to a proof of stake model and keeping it proof of work so that it's the mining hash which requires constant reinvestment and constant work that is the driver of the future technical roadmap of the network and that sustains the network for both security and computing power. Um, the fact that Satoshi holds five or whatever percent of the coins doesn't matter in terms of deciding the direction of Bitcoin if 
there's no mining hash behind that. That's the big difference. If you read the white paper, it's very focused on proof of work, determining the blockchain and determining disagreements. Um, and that's why we don't like proof of stake models, which people, are, again, are happy to pursue. But we think it creates problems for the very reason you identified, is that someone can pre-mine a lot of coins, award themselves a lot of coins, and therefore forever put themselves in the king role. I, were you specifically talking about direction? I thought maybe your question was more related to like this guy's going to dump them all on the market and the price of Bitcoin's going to go down. Like, what do you think? What do you think he would do with them? But in what, in, in what way would he have control? Like how would he exert his control by having coins? Can I just jump in here? Because I, I think I hear what you're saying from more of a zoomed out ideological perspective. And this is where ideology and like the practicality and technology collide for me. And I think a lot of people where yes, in this space, you're absolutely correct. And 100% like there's, there's not the ability to necessarily change or influence anything within this ecosystem, which is completely not the physical world in which um, the power of having a resource that, I mean, data is the new oil, um, or, is, or is perceived as a different kind of power that spills into the real world and reorganizes um, people into different hierarchies of, of control and power and maybe doesn't solve larger problems. And I, I don't have an answer for you. I think that the answer is um, there are incredibly interesting things to think about and to, to then there's governance and there is um, terrifying implications for the world in which we interact as people and give people um, a resource and therefore social capital and influence over ideas and um, the, the direction of the world really and I love getting stuck into the practicality but I also think it's important to address the ideology and that's what I hear in your question is yeah like how do we know that we can trust this person like who is this person but beyond that like are we just creating a new type of broken system and we're just getting caught up in how the technology is going to work and governance will sort itself out later and that's incredibly dangerous to me so i just wanted to add that in that's my two cents i think maybe uh the satoshi's coins maybe aren't the most valuable thing that he has it's probably his voice and his vision so if he came back and proved that he you know did own some of these coins and he'd probably have a lot of say over the direction of bitcoin just socially because he built out the system but, but i huh he or she or they that's not necessarily what they wanted yeah well i but we don't really know like but exactly because they're not but around they anymore, already so. have more power in the scenario than everybody else how is that decentralization well, no well it wouldn't like yes that would be a problem <laughs> if yeah. he came, if he came back and started is saying, there, is it an ideological? Was, was Satoshi thinking in both an ideology and, um, you know, uh, in the like transfer of value, or was it just one or the other? I mean, it was obviously more, would be more the transfer of value side, but I refuse to believe that somebody who would come up with such an, an incredible way to decentralize all kinds of power and all kinds of exchanges, not only uh, value but information that becomes valuable. How could they not have that in mind? And how could they not see a more responsible application of decentralization? So I'll ask the panel to, uh, I guess, think about this question in your uh, final statement, which I'll be asking very soon. Did John, did you have? Um... Oh, I just, <laughs> yeah, we are getting quite um, engaged here. But I just want to step back a bit. And we're all in this room, and we're all engaged. There are billions of people out there who aren't engaged in what we are. Do you think, and I'd like to hear from each of the panel, there, are, there is a major barrier to entry for people to go in there? What is that? And how do we get greater diversity, both gender diversity, adoption, cultural, socioeconomic, um, uh, geopolitical, how do we do that? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest barrier to entry to any cryptocurrencies is the centralized uh, cryptocurrency exchange space. It takes a lot of time to get into that. But um, once you do your first Bitcoin transaction or first cryptocurrency transaction, uh, you'll be hooked, I think. Um, the first time I did mine, I felt this sense of power that no one could control uh, the money that I was sending to, to someone else. So I think everyone who owns cryptocurrency, um, take it down into your own wallet and do a transaction and see how you feel afterwards. Yes, there are huge barriers to get into this space. Um, and I think I was totally naive as to how big the barriers were. 
Um, shameless plug, we just uh, launched, soft launched our beta platform for our payments to the adult industry last week in Seattle at a Women in Blockchain meetup. And I was so excited because I just knew that our sales were going to go through the roof. I thought everyone would want to buy a vibrator with their ETH. And there were plenty of people who wanted to, but even people who worked at major exchanges, I won't say who, didn't have money in their wallet ready to go. I spoke to another woman who's a co-founder of a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform, and she didn't know how to send money from her Coinbase wallet. People aren't using crypto for transactions. Like, we all sit around and talk about the technology and its potential and how great it is, but general everyday people find the space incredibly intimidating. People talk down to them, they're condescending, there's too much information, they don't know where to begin, and it's like, oh, I don't have time for this. And then even people in the space, there isn't enough things for us to actually just spend it on, or at least the information isn't forthcoming. We're still talking more about being a, a store of value. Um, so I, that actually really excites me because we're in the space of trying to make it more usable and getting people to transact. Um, and I think there's a massive long road ahead of us, but I'm really excited because I really think that's the biggest opportunity right now. We need more people in that space driving it forward. Uh, it needs to be just a lot easier. Um, which means the products and applications out there need to have very easy user interfaces that anyone can understand. It's why we invested in Handcash, one of the top cryptocurrency mobile wallets in the world out of Spain. It has the most easy user interface I've seen. It uses NFC technology, so you could just put my phone next to your phone and transmit. Um, Bitcoin SV, they only support SV. They're working on a merchant um, payment system as well, so it's like Apple Pay. Things like that will make it really easy. You don't have to send to a Bitcoin address a long giant set of digits. You pick a user handle, you know, at Jimmy, and then you send anywhere in the world to the user handle. And some other companies are looking at adopting that to create kind of an interoperable ecosystem. It's that so that your mother, your sister doesn't feel afraid to use it and it feels foreign. I've had people come to me since I worked in the Bitcoin world and say, I want to buy, but it's scary. And it can't be scary, and that's why we believe so much in a regulation-friendly mindset, because the normal person for this to really grow has to feel comfortable using it, and it can't be scary to them. They can't feel like they're gonna lose all their money because Cardriga's <coughs> founder died, and they shouldn't have to know um, the nuances of a uh, difference between an old Bitcoin address and a Bitcoin cash address in order to send a transaction. It should just be really simple. Yes, definitely agree. Um, one last thing that I would add is that capacity building in this kind of granular stuff is really important. And um, I look at my first experience was like, oh shit, this is really scary. I'm pressing some buttons and I don't know what's happening. But then I did it once and as someone, as you said, I believe, um, yeah, it was fine. But there are people being told at the moment by people who have the same amount of qualifications to, or like, potentially even less, who weren't in this space a year ago, they're being told, you probably are, are too new to this space to understand. It's really, really complicated. Let us handle that for you. And shrouding this kind of, um, something that's not that hard, like just go out there, push the buttons, I'll show you how to do it. Let's practically like have a workshop where instead of saying, I've got you, I'll, I'll do it. You probably, you probably are too new, you wouldn't get it. It is scary. Instead of doing that, like creating that narrative of, um, this is a, a magical world in which I am the only one with the answer, even though I come from a completely different industry and wasn't in crypto until I realized what an investment opportunity it was. It, it, until we stop with that, and like the mysticism needs to stop. I wanna show you how to press the buttons. You wanna learn how to, to transfer stuff. You wanna learn how to, what it is to hold Bitcoin and then um, you know, potentially get up to another level of, of exchange or just holding value. Talk to me or anybody else who has the same view. And I think all of us need to adopt that view. It's up to us to make it more accessible at just the level of like, press some buttons, like we can do it. We're human beings with executive functions in our brains that are in, like the most complex that they've ever been. So I believe in us. So and that was my rant because I'm getting very, very just, jet lagged. Sorry, just, Taylor. Just on um, that final thought. Um, so my last question to the panel is, uh, what are you optimistic about um, in the next coming 10 years? Just a small question to finish it off. Um, I, I, I really think uh, blockchain offers an interesting way to incentivize systems that have been operating 
um, purely based on altruism beforehand. Um, so particularly uh, systems that operate on internet privacy like Tor. So that's what we're, we're working on at the moment. We're looking at Tor and in in incentivizing uh, Tor routers uh, to be able to route private data. And I think that's a really interesting thing. And just the way blockchain and the privacy space is increasing, people are becoming a lot more aware of their privacy. I think that's probably one of the most interesting things that's Thing that's, that's going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, and yeah, if you, if you uh, want to uh, get your first uh, like Bitcoin transaction, come up to me after the talk and I'll give you a tiny bit of Bitcoin. And I'm sure Jimmy would like to give you some tiny little bit of Bitcoin SP or something as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Jimmy can give you a bit more. Leah, what are your plans? Oh, it's really simple for me. I'm just really excited to see how uh, blockchain powered technologies and crypto can economically empower marginalized communities um, and solve financial exclusion across the world. Uh, I'm excited for the next years just to build. Um, I think the Bitcoin world has for too long been caught up in fights and disagreements between competing camps and philosophies and that halted for too long its progress. Um, it sh we should be a lot further along than we are. I'm excited to have a path forward where our team and those who believe in our vision can just build, scale, build, and let's see what happens and let the results and marketplace decide um, what's best, what works best for enterprises and for the ordinary consumer. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what it's going to matter. I, I don't, that's why I, online I don't engage in a lot of the cat fights that happen. And I, for the most part, ignore the online forums because I've got my head down and uh, I'm going to talk to enterprises, I'm going to talk to people and we're going to build uh, and see if Satoshi's vision was right or not. Um, and if we are right, then we will have a future one day with a lot fewer coins, which will be a lot less confusing to the ordinary person. You shouldn't have to go to the store and pull out your wallet and go, which of 50 cryptocurrencies do I want to pay for, pay with today? Um, so whether it'll be one, we believe it'll be one. There may be others and that's okay too for different purposes. Um, but that's what I'm most excited for is actually having a path to proving whether Satoshi's vision is correct or not. Yeah, cool, on the same page. I, to me, I, as I said before, this is where the work begins. This is where I think that these conversations can come to the forefront rather than the let's all, we're all in this huge investment opportunity together sort of vibe or even just the vibe of don't question it, it's going to change the world have a cult-like sense of, of under, or not understanding, the opposite of that, a cult-like sense of confidence in it working, but a lack of understanding in how that will look. And um, I'm ready to engage with people, I'm ready to examine my own beliefs, and I think that that's where um, things will actually start to change in the way that um, disruption is supposed to occur. So that's really exciting to me. And also I'm looking forward to not just getting shut down and told that I don't understand economics or crypto economics um, when I question anything about the cryptocurrency bubble. Um, because I feel like if you don't understand economics, basic economics and how a bubble forms, your probs don't understand crypto economics. Just an opinion. <laughs> So thank you for that. So today, you know, we've taken a step back, had a look at the picture of where we came from, where we are today, and talk about, you know, where we're headed with uh, with Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, we've it's a over overall uh, kind of synthesis, but I think we've got into really good discussions on various topics as well. I want to thank the panel for making the time today and, and joining us. Uh, it was a very, from my, in my opinion, very high quality conversation. Uh, very collegial conversation um, and also wanted to thank uh, the Blockchain Centre for supporting this uh, event, uh, Pause Fest obviously. I uh, want to thank uh, uh, Jess uh, Reesby for helping with the, uh, our media partners uh, as well as Coinstop and the Miss Blockchain Network. So uh, it's good to see you know, really uh, good uh, female representation on, in this discussion as well. Um, so, um, hope you enjoyed today, and may the hash power or the community be with you. <laughs> oh, hello. This is working. All right. Um, thank you all. Can you all join me in thanking Taylor for setting up this event, talking to pause, fantastic moderation. Thank you so much for that.